Welcome to Masterminds Lessons in Leadership. I am joined by my co-host, Peter Linneman, where through the course of this series, we discuss the intersection of strategy and leadership, which is at the vortex of what we feel makes all great companies great. And we are excited and privileged to have Stephanie Leonards with us, who is the president of Marriott International. And Stephanie, so that I don't um, somehow run afoul, if you could give the audience a little bit of a, uh, a snapshot of your esteemed career history and a little bit about your role at Marriott, uh, that would be great. And then we will uh, segue into the, uh, to the uh, questions. So welcome and thank you. Well, thank you, Bill, and thank you, Peter, for having me today. It's, it's a real honor to spend some time with both of you and talk about these important topics. So, yes, I am the president of Marriott International, a, a role I took on earlier this year after the very sad passing of Marriott International CEO Arnie Sorensen, who I'm sure many of your listeners uh, knew um, and uh, had heard of, a wonderful man, a wonderful leader. I've been with the company for 24 years, so most of my career joined Marriott at a business school, and I did a brief stint with Hilton Hotels um, uh, right out of college before I went to business school. But I've held a variety of different jobs at, at Marriott over the course of my career, started in finance, and have really worked at every discipline, at corporate headquarters, sales, marketing, brand, technology, development, uh, et cetera. And in my current role, I, um, I oversee brand, marketing, sales, uh, customer engagement, technology, um, uh, global real estate development, global design, and global operations in my new president role. Um, I am also oversee Marriott International's new businesses, such as the new home rental business we started in 2019, Homes and Villas by Marriott International, the new Ritz-Carlton yacht business that will launch later this year, to name just a couple. But I grew up in the hotel business. My family uh, owns and operates a small boutique hotel on Capitol Hill and has had a lot of restaurants in D.C. over the years. So it's in my blood um, and it's, um, it's, it's, uh, it's a great uh, Marriott. It's a great company and, and I'm honored to have this expanded role that I, that I just took on earlier this year, as I mentioned. But again, thanks for having me today. Well, it's very exciting and it's a very exciting time. And I suspect if we rewound to, say, February of 2020, you would have told us about the company's great strategy and how you've had this carefully uh, uh, thought out strategy and implementation exercise. And then, oh, my God. Uh, and it's been, I'm sure, scrambling with Arnie's illness and passing even adding to all that. So how have you been in real time formulating strategy in, in this environment uh, and trying to in implement that strategy in a timely way? Yeah, 2020 was certainly one for the record books, um, uh, you know, really just an amalgamation of devastating circumstances across that, you know, what happened from a health perspective, economic, the social issues that happened last year. I mean, in terms of our company, um, it was really, it was devastating. There's really no other words to describe 2020. And, and you know, in some parts of the world, 21 is still quite rough, uh, India and Brazil, to, to note just a couple. But, um, you know, just as a little context for how bad 2020 was for our company and our industry, you know, in April and May of last year, our business was down 90%. 25% of our hotels were closed. 70% plus of corporate headquarters was laid off and hundreds of thousands of um, employees at our hotels were either um, laid off or on severely reduced work weeks. Um, the, the best one liner I have to put it all in context is Mr. Marriott, who's 89 years old, said last year, it was at a meeting in April, I'll never forget it. He's, you know, I've been around a long time. I've seen wars and riots and I've seen a lot. This isn't my first rodeo but it's by far my worst. So that just is a little context for how bad 2020 was for our company and our industry and our sector, as I know both of you know very well. So against that backdrop um, uh, of 2020, um, I think our approach to strategy, first of all, during this time frame, was to stay very closely connected as a leadership team. We have 30 brands. We're in 140 different countries around the world. And 
we were on the phone, um, Arnie, the CEO at the time, his direct reports, one, two, three, four times a day. Uh, again, given all the time zones we do business in. So we stayed very, very connected as a leadership team. I think we also understood that given the pace of change in 2020, that we weren't going to be able to have all the information we kind of typically have to make decisions. And we're going to have to be doing some things on the fly. So we really leaned into the collective leadership experience we had, a very long tenured team. And we had to move really, really quickly uh, last year to make decisions. Um, you know, as the pandemic kind of unfolded, we did use a lot of data and analytics to inform our strategies to navigate the waters. Um, not only data that we collected from our customers and our partners, but, you know, uh, reading what economists had to say and what were the macro trends. And interestingly, working with the tech companies like Google and Apple on mobility data to say, what are, when are we seeing our searches starting to come up for travel again? So we would know when we would spend marketing dollars again or staff up our hotels. But I think the most fundamental point from a strategy perspective, I'd say in 2020, is that we kept our people at the center of everything that we did. Our employees and our customers and their safety and well-being was our was our number one focus, and also the the health of our owners. Um, many people don't know that Marriott International doesn't actually own the hotels, right? We own very few. We work with third party owners and partners uh, to build um, to build the hotels, and, and they own the real estate. So we had to make sure we were very supportive of our owners who were going through a very difficult time. But again, um, it was it was a very tough year. But um, uh, you know, my dad has a great expression. Who runs the oldest Irish bar in Washington D.C.? He says, and he's seen a lot too. He says, "Tough time." He says, "Tough times don't last, but tough people do." So that was our mantra for 2020, and, and things are certainly looking better this year. Peter, that's a mantra we have to remember. <clears throat> great line, great line. No, no question about it. No question about it. So, um, Stephanie, let's segue back to the this whole topic of leadership. Uh, and, you know, as we've talked to people like John Gray and Chris Nassetta and Sam Zell, the issue of culture comes up time and time again and how strongly leaders feel that culture and business success are intertwined. Uh, tell us a little bit about um, Marriott's, you know, I, I would say famous culture, you know, a culture well-known and well-respected by everybody. And, and and how did that, you know, kind of get you through some of the difficult times? And how do you see it getting through what you have to do tomorrow? Yeah, I mean, culture is the backbone of Marriott International. Um, Marriott, again, is a 94-year-old company. Um, and you don't, you know, stay around that long and succeed for that long, I don't think, without a really strong cultural foundation. And there's there's five core values that make up our culture. And we talk about them a lot and they guide everything that we do. And I'll touch on them really quickly to give you a flavor of kind of what is our what is our grounding. Um, the first is put people first. And I know it's so simple and sounds so basic, but we are in the people business. We're in the hospitality business. We're in the service business. And really, our associates are our most important stakeholders because it's through our associates that we get to our customers um, and make money for our owners uh, who own the hotel. So, you know, the first the first principle is to put people first. Secondly, pursue excellence. And this, I think foundationally, this is all about superior customer service at our 8,000 hotels. Again, 30 brands, everything from Ritz Carlton and St. Regis and W in addition to Marriott's to Sheridan's to Courtyard's to Fairfield. Don't worry, I won't name them all, but we have a <laughs> wide range of brands and we need to be making sure that we're delivering superior customer service at all touch points at all brands. Uh, the third core value that's instrumental to our culture is embrace change. Innovation has always been at the foundation of uh, what makes Marriott tick. Marriott's been in a lot of different businesses over the years. Um, I'd say most recently, one of the biggest changes was the acquisition of Starwood Hotels in 2016. That was the biggest deal in our industry ever. Um, it was incredibly complicated. It, um, I actually led the integration. It was not without its bumps and challenges, but we embraced that change um, in, and we got through it. And I, I think strategically it was a, a brilliant move on 
Arnie's part. And we've also recently gone into some new businesses. I mentioned a few of them in the beginning, uh, rent, home rentals, yacht, again, in a small way to complement our Marriott Bonvoy loyalty program. But this idea that we always need to reinvent ourselves and change is um, the third core value. Four, act with integrity. This is the idea that how we do business is just as important as the business we do. And then the fifth core value that's fundamental to our culture is about serving our world. And that um, as a company, we strive to be a source of, and a, a, a force for good. And so this has to do with the very clear goals we have around um you know, the environment. We have very clear 2025 goals around reducing our carbon footprint and food waste. Food waste is one of the largest contributors to greenhouse gases and hotels can have a lot of food waste. Um, what our commitment to, ver to diversity, um, you know, we're very focused on the advancement of women, minorities, LGBTQ, diversity in the broadest sense of the word. And we have very clear goals set out, um, you know, what gets measured gets done. And then things like we're very focused on human trafficking. Sadly, that's a, that happens in hotels. So we've developed training, see something, say something to prevent human trafficking. And we didn't just keep it for ourselves. We shared it with the whole industry. So if, just a few examples on, on how we think about serving our world. But those five core values guide our strategies, guide, um, guide us. And they've been instrumental in helping us get through this pandemic. And, uh, you know, we're coming through on the other side and things are looking brighter, as I mentioned a few minutes ago. So it's it's really um, that's our backbone. So you're, we're hopefully coming out of this. And um, it's interesting. I want to ask, what's it like to follow in the footsteps of a legend particularly as you try to come out of the most unusual time ever, at least in our careers ever. And how do you formulate, here's where we're going to go and we're all going to go there together, uh, because you certainly are following a legend and you're certainly forming strategy from a blank sheet of paper almost, right? So what's your thought in that regard? Yeah, I mean, you know, I guess I'm sure Arnie Sorensen, our, again, our beloved CEO, followed Mr. Marriott. He was only the third CEO. Tony is the CEO, and I'm the president following Arnie, who I consider a leg legend. So there's multiple legends at our company. I'm not sure which ones you're referring to, but I can, I'm going I'm to speak of Arnie, who was, a, to me, an amazing legend. So following someone like Arnie, um, I know Tony and I both think about this a lot, is, is, a, is, um, it's a big deal, and, and we we think of him every day. I think of him every day. He was an amazing man. Um, he was an amazing CEO. He was also an amazing person, family man, gave back to to the world through nonprofits, et cetera. But throughout the pandemic, what I admired most about Arnie was the openness, the transparency that he showed to our teams, the empathy, the emotion. He wasn't afraid to show emotion. And he always was painting a hopeful picture for the future because he knew, and he was right, the travel demand would come back. People love to travel and that we would get through this. And throughout it all, he painted the picture of hope, but in a very realistic way about the tough current circumstances. So when I think of the company moving forward, I think of leading the same way Arnie did with honesty and empathy and openness. And he was a great listener too. And so that's how I think about how we're going to lead Marriott into this next chapter. Um, he was a really remarkable man. Can I just follow up on a small one? You're in all likelihood going to have some parts of your footprint opening up big, 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 like the United States, probably England and so forth. And you're going to have other parts of your footprint opening very slowly. What's your thought about managing that forward? Well, you're, you're absolutely right, Peter. Um, I'll give you a perfect example of your point. China, actually, which is Marriott International's second largest market, our business in China came back um, almost to normal, meaning 2019 levels in, in May of last year, right? As they got the virus under control um, well before there was a vaccine, leisure, business, and group uh, all came back in China. 
And we are seeing a very uneven recovery around the world. We're seeing in the United States, the business coming back pretty strong. Now, China and the U.S. are both very large domestic markets, right? They have 95 plus percent of the business is, you know, in the country for the country. Um, in the case of China, the Chinese aren't traveling outbound right now. So we're really benefiting from that as they um, stay within their country for leisure trips as well. But in other parts of the world, the recovery is very rocky. Um, obviously, places like India and Brazil and um, Southeast Asia, other parts where the virus is not um, at the same place of you know recovery. So our, our business is very choppy. And we're really kind of navigating that similar to how we did last year, um, daily calls with the team to figure out what they need, looking at any data that will give us a glimpse into the future. Because part of the challenge we have is when these ho when the demand comes back, it's zero to 60, right? And we need to quickly staff up these hotels, which has been a challenge, right? And we need to quickly make sure that we get our marketing efforts underway. So we really are using as much data and forward looking information as we can gather to inform our teams on the ground in these markets that are still not recovered yet. But I would say zooming out for a moment, overall, the recovery is looking pretty good. Every week I look at the data from around the world and the numbers get better and better. Leisure is, of course, leading the recovery. I mean, our um, Memorial Day weekend's numbers here in the States were just fantastic. We had hotels at 90% occupancy. Going back to something I said before, in the depths of the pandemic, our business was down 90%. So, I mean, it's nice to see a 90 number that has a different context to it. Um, but so things are really looking better, um, you know, almost everywhere in the world as every day passes. I am a big believer that all segments of travel will come back in some way, shape or form, um, including meetings and business travel. It may look a little different. Um, but I can tell you this, uh, Bill and Peter, leisure travel is there is a lot of pent up demand for leisure travel. It is just exploding. Yeah, it's interesting, Stephanie, because I didn't expect to be back on the road for business until after Labor Day. And I'm going on my third business trip in four weeks uh, out to San Francisco. So I, I think, you know, people are definitely embracing getting back out and seeing one another and doing business together, which is uh, which is great. Um, going back to the issue of leadership again, Stephanie, you've had a lot of different jobs uh, across the company, you know, managing different kinds of people, different functions and whatever. Um, and that's obviously groomed you well to step into the role you have today. If somebody had to ask you the one key leadership lesson uh, that you've learned and that you'll probably utilize the most in the role you have today, what would you say it is? For me, I think it's all about surrounding myself with a team that complements the skills that I don't have. No one person has it all. I don't. Um, there's things I don't know, and I need to make sure that I'm humble enough to recognize that and surround myself. And I don't think in my company, I don't think in any company, none of us does, none of us do anything on our own. It's all about the team. And I really believe that. So to me, surrounding myself with people, this speaks to diversity too. You know, um, a diverse team that that is complementary um, to one another to me um, is is I think the most important way to succeed in my company or any company. And obviously, listening to them is part listening. of that. Uh, is part of that. Exactly. Yeah, you know, absolutely. For sure. yeah. Listening, and I think listening is key. Listening and um, and then as you listen and gather input, being able to make the tough decisions too. Right? You know, you got to. At the end of the day, you have to make decisions. So listen, gain what information you can, and then make decisions and move forward with you know confidence. And by the way, don't be afraid to change your mind or change your decision if you made a mistake. I think that gets back to being humble. We, you, maybe you get new information that means you need to change your decision. That's okay too. Mm -hmm. um, but that's all needs to be done, I think, in the context of a diverse, strong team that, um, you know, in my case, I always think likes each other and has each other's backs too. So you've mentioned a couple of times your father and your parents. Um, suppose I told you I've got a phone in my hand and I've got your parents on the line. What are they going to say makes the, that you do that makes them proudest? I think they are going to say that I um, 
have done a lot, particularly this last decade of my career to mentor, um, mentor people um, and help um, and particularly help, I think, um, women um, move ahead. And of course, I mentor men too at Marriott, but I have a real passion for seeing more women um, advance in my company and just in business in general. Um, I'd say they would be most proud of just my commitment to help other people at Marriott, not just be focused on my, uh, my on myself and on my own career, but to, to be, you know, pay it forward. Many people helped me over the course of my career. And at this stage of my life and in my career, I think it's my job to pay it forward to others. And, um, you know, my parents, again, who were in the business too, at a much smaller scale, small hotels, small restaurants, but they always took care of the employees that worked in their business. They would come to our house for the holidays. They just, it was a family. I grew up in a family business and I think they are proud that even though I work for the largest hotel company in the world, the way I approach my job and the way Marriott really runs is, believe it or not, more like a, a family business. So Stephanie, I'm going to finish up with one question and then let Peter um, uh, close it out. But Let's assume you've got the next generation of leadership underneath you uh, around a table and you want to give them one critical piece of advice as they've stepped up into the roles that they're now occupying and, and playing a major part in running the company. Knowing what you know, what, what advice would you give them as they step up and play, play an increasingly important role in the business? Well, besides some of the things I've already mentioned, um, I would say um, know your stuff, right? I think there's no substitute for just knowing your stuff. Work hard, you know, study your discipline, you know, know your facts, do your research, right? I mean, there's nothing that can replace that. Um, I have a, a particular passion for like, the role I think technology will play in my business um, and in all businesses. And so I often, when I'm talking to my team and, and young people coming up through the ranks, I always say, know your stuff and particularly know your stuff about technology because it's the backbone of so many things that we want to do in the future, um, including at the property level. So again, know your stuff, do your research, work hard, um, and again, build a great team. Mm -hmm. So you alluded to uh, passing, it, passing it forward and behind Bill is a sign that mentions integrity and generosity and, and Marriott is well known at a corporate level for its uh, philanthropy and its involvement in community. And so what is your slash the company's uh, perspective and values in terms of philanthropy and community involvement? Well, I think this really harkens back to core value number five that I talked about, which is around serving um, our world. And so Marriott is um, very involved in a variety of nonprofits, um, you know, Children's Miracle Network, to name one that's a big focus for the, the corporate team. And we, since we do business in 140 different um, countries, often the properties in a particular city or area will be very involved with the nonprofits. Um, in that area. We have something to call Spirit to Serve. It is a day where globally all around the world, all of us on one single day, will go out and do um, some type of work in the community. It could be all of corporate headquarters. We get on buses and go, all the hotels do it. We all kind of all at once. Well, I guess given time changes, all within a relatively small you know time frame, uh, do um, go out and do community service. But each at the hotel level, it's this is where we really connect with the community. I mean, as some context, Marriott pre-pandemic had about 750,000 employees. 96% of them work at a hotel. So the majority of our people are at a hotel. And so it's all about how the hotel interacts with the local community, I think, is where it really comes to life. And our general managers in each um, city around the world have what they call business councils. And this is where the GMs of the hotels come together to figure out how they can best interact with the community, including nonprofits. Um, so there's just so many ways that um, the company gives back to the world. But I think the most powerful probably is through our properties who are on the ground um, working with the communities in which they do business. And, you know, 
habitat for humanity. I mean, I could go on and on with many, many examples, but it's the on the ground, I think, interaction of our properties with the communities in which they do business that's most powerful to me. So, Bill, I'll let you take it home from here. Stephanie, fabulous and, and great insights into a great company and a great person. Right. Yes, yeah, Stephanie, thank you so much. I mean, it's, um, it's just amazing everything that, you know, the industry's been through, the world's been through, and you all have been through. And uh, to your collective credit, um, you're coming out stronger for it. And uh, God bless you for doing it. Um, you know, the greatest test of leadership is in crisis. And you all have stepped forward and, and done a wonderful job. And I know everybody in the industry uh, is proud of what you've done and, and looks forward to the world continuing to, to get better and better. So with that, you know, uh, in addition to Peter, I, I, I thank you and appreciate the time and, and the insights as our audience will as well. So thanks very much. Well, thank you, gentlemen. And I look forward to welcoming both of you back in our hotels very soon for business or pleasure. So come, come see. Hopefully, hopefully, hopefully. Come visit us soon. Thank you.